Well, welcome everyone. It's Jane Atkinson back with the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. And today we are talking about one of my favorite subjects, so much so that I wrote a book about it. Today we are talking about scaling your speaking business. And we have Ravi Abuvala on the show who has done just that. Welcome, Ravi. Well, thank you so much, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. And everybody that's lending me your ears, uh, I'm hoping this is going to be a very fruitful next, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, now let's get clear. It wasn't necessarily a speaking business that you have scaled. So in the past 14 months, you have scaled two seven figure businesses. Tell us about those. And then I want to kind of break down how you did that. Yeah, of course. So the first business is called Prospect Social. It's an advertising agency. I essentially dropped out of law school to create that and didn't really know what I was doing at the very beginning of it. But, uh, you know, through uh, actually, I'm sure some of the things we'll talk about later, I was able to scale it to a multiple seven figure company uh, in about 14 months. And we primarily service larger companies like legal leads, like companies that are buying 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars worth of leads from us every single month. And then from growing and scaling that company, a lot of my friends started reaching out. How are you doing this? Like, you know, I was living in South America, living in Europe, traveling, you know, this is before everything happened. <laughs> and uh, so I started giving just quick little one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions with my friends. They started seeing results. They started, uh, you know, referring people out. Next thing I knew, we had a full-blown business incubator called Scaling with Systems. We've helped over a thousand clients, including people like Kevin Harrington, Fortune 100 CEOs. And uh, that's what I've been really blessed with. And although it's not a speaking gig, what speakers are pretty much being paid for, in my opinion, is their expertise and their advice. And so in my, in my personal opinion, I think what we're doing is a little bit more efficient than just a one-off speaking gig, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later here. Okay. All right. So you've been through this a couple of times. You've, you're uh, living the life. <laughs> you told me you just moved from California to Miami. That's a big uh, adjustment I'd be curious to know about, but that's, that's neither here nor there. We're talking about kind of what some of the keys to scaling are. I mean, your, your company is called Scaling with Systems, so I'm going to hazard a guess that systems are a big part of it. Talk a little bit about what kinds of systems you think people need in order to scale. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Jane. So in my opinion, there's really two main systems that you need inside of a business, client acquisition, client fulfillment, mm. bottom line, right? Especially a service-based business, which speaking gigs are typically a service-based business, right? Mm -hmm. So I usually like to nail down client acquisition first, and then we worry about client fulfillment. Most people, they gasp when I say that, they, they have to spend years and months on making the perfect client fulfillment. I'm not ready. You know, I, people aren't going to pay me for my, my time, whatever else it is. But in reality, I think you should spend a lot of time up front, you know, proving product market fit, making sure your messaging works, making sure you can go after a cold audience, making sure you can have a duplicatable process like cold email or Facebook ad or cold calling or, or LinkedIn messaging that's bringing you new clients. And then once you figure that out, then we want to look at the client fulfillment and systemize that, right? What are we doing right now? It's not uncommon for a lot of my clients to start kind of what we had talked about, trading their time for money in the very beginning while they're proving their concept, they're acquiring clients. But at some point, it's like, you know, the 14, 15, 16 hour days kind of catch up to them. That there has to be a better way. And then I'm like, well, let's look at the client fulfillment side. Uh, you know, what do we need to be doing? Not working with every single person that, that has a credit card, right? Going after a certain specific amount of people. Another really great one, which I wanted to make sure we touched upon here was, you know, digitizing your information, digitizing your product. So I know there's a lot of speakers that listen to your podcast. You have an incredible podcast. I know it gives a lot of value. And so for the people listening to this, if you do not have a digital delivery for your service, then you're going to pretty much be working for money for your entire life. I mean, you know, heaven forbid there's a worldwide pandemic that prevents you from speaking on stages, right? <laughs> or heaven forbid something happens to you and you can't speak. Well, I run a coaching program where we have hundreds of new clients every single month and I only hop on two group coaching calls a week and a lot of our delivery is on a 120 module course on the back end, which teaches them a lot of what my expertise is. So they can watch it in the morning, in the afternoon, they don't have to fly anywhere. They can sit in their home, sit in their bed, listen to it and consume it at their own speed, which I think is something that's really valuable as far as systemizing kind of the back end of this delivery. Beautiful. Now, I think that um, I talk a lot and this is a big feature of scaling your speaking business, the new book is 
you know, when you trade your time for money, and I use Ryan Estes as an example because he's one of my clients that a lot of everybody knows who went from zero to a million very, well, not very quickly, but he, he got there and was probably two plus when uh, COVID hit. And he is now looking at, okay, online courses, digitizing his uh, intellectual property, books, uh, maybe he'll get to the idea of a mastermind or some sort of group that will allow you to go not just one-to-one -one when you're coaching, but one-to-many. And uh, I love that we're talking about this. Um, so really be thinking about, and COVID I think has forced everybody to really think about this. How can you look at this? Okay, so you say, uh, client acquisition first and then fulfillment. And when he's talking about fulfillment, he's talking about what is your system for actually delivering a presentation, beginning, middle, end, all of your client. And interestingly enough, you don't actually need to design the speech until you've sold it anyway, which is a lot of people I think think that everything has to be perfect before they go, ta-da, here I am, I'm ready to sell to you. Is is there a little bit of perfectionism caught in there somewhere? Yeah, I think that's a great point. It definitely is. And I think everybody catches, I, it's either A, perfectionism or B, procrastination, which I think are kind of two sides of the same coin, to be honest with you, right? You're saying it really needs to be perfect, but in reality, you just don't want to do the work or you don't want to present it. So, and I'm not speaking on a pedestal fear, here. fear, like yeah. just straight up old fear of being rejected, right? Which I have as well. Everybody has, and I'm not saying that I don't have it, but yeah. um, you know, I just think there's more efficient ways to do it. And then talking about the digital product, that's awesome what your client is doing. Like, for example, it's even, but in my mind, I love, I still think that speaking on stage is one of the best forms of communication, uh, you know, mechanisms of actually delivering some kind of service than that they'll ever be. You have so much authority. The marketing is great. Everyone's amped up. There's an atmosphere in the room. But what I like to do is I only hold one to two events a year. So I'm having one in April, you know, that I'm hosting in Miami and we sold out in 48 hours from all of these people that have been consuming me digitally and now they're amped to see me in person. And so now I have like all this energy stored up instead of me having to, because I've done plenty of events both on stage and off stage and I know how much energy goes into it. And instead it's like, you're kind of putting it all into this one big one that you're hosting yourself instead of having to wait for someone to hire you, hopefully hire you, pay you, whatever else it is. Like now this is your own audience you've cultivated on your own uh, on your own time, your own systems, which I really love. But yeah, the perfectionism aspect of it is massive, right? And that's, I think the kind of selling before you create, which is a big thing we talk about it as well, is, is part of that also. Like, you know, if you tell somebody you're gonna deliver on something and you're like, great, give me seven days. Well, then you have seven days before you have to like, <laughs> you know, uh, give the money back if you don't deliver it. Where if you're like, okay, before I go to the marketplace, let me make it perfect on this end. Well, then you'll just continuously be refining it and continuously be refining it. And you'll, you have no kind of fire under your ass to actually get it done. So that's why we like to kind of almost put a deadline on us to be like, Hey, I'm going to deliver. Some, even if it's a little rough and dirty, yeah. there's, a, a, I think it's, it's not Pareto's principle. It's Parkinson's law. One of the two says that work expands to fill the amount of time that you give it. So if you right. give it an eternity, it's going to take an eternity. That, if you give it seven days, it'll take seven days. That is 101, time management 101. And yeah. people are often giving themselves far too much time for projects. So if I say I give my podcast an hour max of my time, guess what? I'm going to fit it all in in an hour. But if I say, well, I'm just going to, you know, and then I'm going to tinker with it and blah, blah, blah. It ends up taking me two hours to do a podcast or write a blog post or whatever it might be. I've got it down to 20 minutes. It's a science at this point. Hmm. Now, speaking is a numbers game. And you've already alluded to this idea of client acquisition. We know that, um, okay, so we've talked about leveraging your time and not necessarily trading your time for money. And the entire book, Scaling Your Speaking Business, we have a ton of ideas on how you can not trade your time for money. Some of them require a little bit of setup on the front end, but like an online course, you do the heavy lifting and then you're done. You set it, you don't set it and forget it, but you set it and you kind of let it go. Um, client acquisition in terms of speeches is a numbers game. We go out, we plant the seeds, we, um, 
circle back, you know, is there any interest in this? And we close the deal, which is, you know, it's kind of this old fashioned call, send call thing that we used to do way back when we sent out a package, a box with a VHS tape in it way before Ravi, you were even born probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talk a little bit about the types of client acquisition systems that you might see working in speaking? Sure. So we've had plenty of speaking clients for our, ourselves, some pretty big ones, honestly. Um, like I said, I've done, uh, you know, last year, my goal, ironically, uh, was tw 12 speaking events. and I did 28 uh, last year, even during everything else that was happening. You're getting so, them for yourself. For them, for myself, right? Doing awesome. them for myself. Um, uh, and it was a blast. I had a great time, but I was, it was other people's events that I was speaking at. And mm -hmm. so one of the ways that we did it, and this is just selling one-on-one, -on -one. this is what we help people find as product market fit is like, you know, I know that everyone's listening to this right now. You guys think that you guys are probably, you know, the best things since sliced bread, right? You guys are the best in your industry. You're the best at speaking. And you're like, I don't need to justify why I need to speak at your event. You know, you'd be lucky to have me at your event. But in reality, you kind of need to sell this person on why they need to have you there. And if you really think about it, people that are having you on their podcasts, at their events, whatever else it is for a few reasons. Number one is going to be your audience, right? If you already have a large audience yourself and you can bring that to the events, right? I've been invited to multiple events before I was even really like a domain expertise in my subject, just because I had a massive following online and people just wanted that following me to post, get ticket sales. That's a, right. That's why you see celebrities endorsing mm -hmm. stuff. That's why it works. That's a put bums in seats situation. Exactly. A hundred percent. So that's okay. like one aspect of whether you have an audience or not, that's the other benefit of building a brand and, uh, and having your own program is because you're building an audience. But mm -hmm. then the other uh, side of it is like, okay, why, why should they have you in there? What is the transformation that either the person that is putting you on their stage or the people in their audience are getting, right? Are they getting actionable steps? Are you actually selling them something that they want? So the person that's getting you on stage, you say, hey, you know, I help, um, I help event coordinators fill out their seats and have like, you know, an incredible 90 minute presentation while sharing profits with you. Something like that, where you're saying, these are the benefits that you're going to get when I get on your stage. And a lot of the ways that we see it is the audience, number one, number two is domain expertise. And number three is obviously some kind of profit share. So, Hey, if you let me sell on top of your, at your program, I've historically sold at 50% of everybody that's in the seat will buy my stuff. I'll give you 50% of all of our profits. So now you're talking about, Hey, you're going to make money from me coming and speaking your event. I'm going to fill your seats, et cetera. So once you figure out this messaging side of things, whatever your mechanism, whatever you want to decide is what you should do, then it's pretty much as simple as crafting that into a, a messaging template, which is like, include your story. Like for me, it's, Hey, I'm a law school dropout. My dad had cancer. Then I started this business. Then I was successful. Now I've been on other successful podcasts. I have this large audience and following, and here are some topics that I can speak about scaling, you know, cancer, uh, you know, wealth building, any of those things. And I pretty much craft everything for them. I had someone respond back the other day that said, you did all my work for me. I don't have to do anything. I love you. That's what mm -hmm. they said in a, in a pitch that I sent to somebody. And so that's what you would put together. And then you would, for us personally, the ways that we do it, I'm using podcasts as an example because we're in a world right now where you can't really do a whole lot of in-person events, but you can do this anywhere. But we would go online and find podcasts that are like some of my competitors or some of my, my mentors have been on. And then we'll identify how large is that audience? How many podcasts are they publishing a week? How many um, you know, reviews do they have online? How many followers do they have on social media platforms? And if they hit certain standards, my virtual assistant finds them, scrapes them, and then sends them an email that gives them our pitch. And so for our speakers, they do the same thing. What are the largest events that happen a year in your industry? Typical Google search can find it. Do you have someone else in your industry that you look up to or that's your competitor? What kind of events have they been at? Once again, typical Google search, Facebook search, Instagram search can find that as well. And then you pretty much send a message, a personalized message to them, giving that story, giving that I can fill your seats, giving the here's a transformation, here's the things I can speak about. And if you do that consistently enough, I mean, we have like a 40% response rate. If you do that consistently enough, then you're honestly going to have too many podcasts or too many speaking events and you know what to do with. So it sounds to me like you're dealing mostly with the speak to sell model, whereas we are mostly, for the most part, I think there's going to be some people who can identify with the putting bums in seats and the profit share. Um, but for the most part, we are actually... Um, an industry where people get paid for their expertise primarily. So we're talking, you know, 10,000, 15,000, 30,000 dollars per speech and and then 
if they can put more bums in seats, that's when you get up to those upper um, reigns. It might be a celebrity or somebody like a Ryan who is really, really well known. So when it comes to scaling your business, Ravi, what do you think is the most difficult thing that you've had to face? That's a great question. And just to kind of touch on the last point there really quickly, mm-hmm. I think that's very valid. And you know your audience much better than I do. But I want to challenge everybody who's getting paid for these one-off speaking gigs. Mm-hmm. I want to ch- challenge you to figure out, you know, how can I, what is more appealing to somebody? Paying you $15,000, ha- having them pay you $15,000 and you coming speaking or them not having you to pay anything, but then them getting a profit share of whatever you saw on the back end. I, I actually don't charge ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, although I could just speak at an event. But people let me pitch at the event and I make half a million dollars to a million dollars every single event that I pitch at because I'm allowed to, to sell at the end. So you guys have to decide what's the better use of your time. Yeah. And that kind of comes into productizing the back end, whatever else it is. But I did just want to give it in there. Like some of the greatest speakers we work with and my speaking coach, you know, they always argue it's, it's, it's almost instead of trying to get that ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 paycheck up front, which now it's a cost on the side of the people, people who are paying you. Instead mm-hmm. of having it be an asset where it's like, hey, this person's going to come in here, bring an audience, and we're going to get a percentage of whatever they sell on stage. So, right. Um, there has uh, to be a pretty good sell if from the platform if you're sure. earning a million dollars uh, on the back end. And so it's, it's a very, very different type of um, kind of speaking, se- a, a, a totally different kind of fundamentally different sure. thing that we're typically dealing with. Talk to me a little bit about when it is that you're scaling your business, what some of the things that you might see as stumbling blocks could be. What What's, what's the most difficult thing about scaling? Yeah, so there's a few things that come first to mind. So number one is obviously proving that you actually are selling something that somebody wants. So it's very easy in the this small referral game where you're dealing with 15% of the traffic where it's like, Hey, my mom, my friends, my good buddies who own this space right here, they hired me like I'm a good speaker or I'm good at what I do. It's when you start getting to the, the, the cold audiences, people that couldn't tell the difference between you and a hole in the wall that you're really kind of faced with this mirror where it's like, am I actually selling something that somebody really wants? Like, what is the value of what I'm giving and, and how concisely can I put that inside of a message, right? This is why you should have me speak at your event is because I can do this for you, right? And why is that valuable for you, right? So in your, to your credit, I've had clients of mine that do like safety speeches, right? They do some pretty large safety speeches. They're paid $15,000, $20,000 to come speak about work safety, whatever else it is. And mm-hmm. so it's like, okay, how do we package this so that the cold audience, the people that don't even know who you are, they see the value in hiring you. And so one of the ways we did with the safety ones was we started tying how safety speeches can be tied to employee safety, which can be tied to employee retention, less lawsuits, whatever else it is, which ties to their bottom line. So it's like, hey, we help, you know, whatever it is, industrial size companies, uh, manufacturing companies make an extra $100,000 a year through employment safety speaking uh, speeches. So that's what we're looking to do is try to figure out. And the issue that I see in scaling is everyone's thinking that like, like on a, at a smaller referral level where there's like, hey, Jane's a great person. Hey, Revy's a great person. You should have him at your event. That's like a referral. That's good. But if you're trying to really scale, which it sounds like you've done pretty successfully into the seven figures, you need to be figuring out why would someone who's never met me actually pay me to come at their event? And it's not because Revy said they should or Jane said. It's because you're delivering something that is proven to deliver what they want, which is usually if you're dealing in a B2B space could be the bottom line. Um, so that's number one is, is that, and then number two, kind of like what you and I had talked about even before this went live here was, um, was, was paying to acquire customers or pretty much paying to grow the the pay to play method here. So I really, I'm not a big, I'm, I've been in a few SaaS startups. I I have one myself. Uh, I'm not a big fan of outside funding for multiple reasons, but, um, at a certain point, though, I do think it's beneficially bootstrapped. And then at a certain point, I think it's really beneficial to throw continuous money inside your business. So if you're able to figure out, let's take the example we just talked about earlier. You're doing the uh, the safety speeches. You're getting paid $10,000, $15,000 a gig. We figured out that, hey, they want to pay you because they make an extra $100,000 a year because they don't have employee lawsuits. They don't have to continue to do new employee training, whatever else it is. So then we figure out that that works. We start sending cold emails out to people that are responding back says, yes, I'd like to have you here. So we know every hundred emails, we get 10 responses and we get one paid client from it. Let's just use rough numbers here, right? 
And so then once we do that, well, then why would we not hire someone like inside of Scaling with Systems, we give our clients fully trained virtual assistants. Why would you not hire someone for, for us? It's $3 an hour, but even 10 or $20 an hour to send those hundred emails a day, which you know, in five, seven, 14, 30 days is going to result in a $10,000 gig for you, right? So now you're multiplying your time times two times three times four. And then once you get that part down, then you go into probably one of my favorite things in the entire world, which is paid traffic, right? Now we're actually using... Facebook ads, Google ads, YouTube ads to really be putting stuff in front of people. And that's when it starts to become a real machine where you're saying, hey, Google, here's $1. And then you have a system on the back end that converts that into five, six, seven, eight dollars within 30 to 90 days. Right, right. And, and one of the things that you've said is that you create the system first and then you hire to implement the system. That's one of the things in uh, scaling your speaking business that we talk about is not hiring a person to solve your problem. You need to solve the problem first, get your system in place and know what's working and then hire somebody to, to come in and, and continue to implement the solution. I think a lot of people try to throw money at client acquisition before they actually know how to do it themselves. And uh, do you think that people need to understand it themselves first? Yeah, so I, I actually just did a YouTube video on this. I think there's two types of employees, right? And one of them is pretty much what we call batteries included. And those are when you're hiring someone, maybe a C-level executive, but they're really, they're, they're, number one job is doing something you probably don't already know how to do, right? It could be paid ads. It could be that they're good at tech, product dev, whatever else it is, right? Yeah, I um, hear you. Yeah. And so those are people that are usually a lot more money. And those are people you're hiring as your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh hire. Typically, most people are by themselves, right? Or they make their first hire. You're not looking for that batteries included, which is exactly what you just said a second ago. And especially when it comes to client acquisition, especially when you are the expert, you know the industry more than anybody else, you should really be the one that's crafting this. I, I see people outsourcing their copywriting. I see people outsourcing their ad creation. I see people outsourcing their, their funnel creation, their offer, whatever else it is. And that is the most, we teach our clients how to figure that out themselves Prove it in the marketplace by getting someone to pay you money. And then, like you said, now that we know this 100% works on our own, and yes, guys, here's a little you know hint. It's going to take some work and it's going to be hard and you're going to get rejected. But once you do find something that works, we know this works. It's so much easier to say, hey, I'm going to hire you to do exactly what I did here. Here's how long it takes me. Here are the steps I follow. And here are the rough results that I'm getting. So then when they're doing it, you can figure out, hey, you're taking too long or, hey, you're doing it in the wrong steps or, hey, you're not getting the results that I'm getting. And I know it's a you thing and not a process thing, because if you don't do that, then there's so many variables that could be wrong. It could be the employees doing a bad job. It could be you onboarded them poorly. It could be that the task is wrong. It could be that the KPIs are wrong. And so that's why you, you nailed it on the head there. It's just so much nicer to have that down first. And mm -hmm. then once you have that down first, you say, hey, here's the thing that's already working. Just do it a lot more, please. It's a lot of pressure on someone to come in and actually solve your problem, unless they are, like you said, an expert. I don't expect to solve my Facebook advertising problem. I will hire that out. <laughs> I don't need to understand how to do it, but I do need to understand how to acquire cl clients. And I think that that's important. So I like that you, we talked a little bit about investing in your company because I think a lot of people might make their decisions about investments based on fear. And I don't love decisions based in fear. Talk a little bit about how, how fearless you need to be in order to truly scale. Well, so when you're making money and you, let's just say you make a hundred thousand dollars in a year, right? And that's profit you're taking at home. Well, you could put it into real estate. You can put it into a car. You could put it into the S and P 500. Those things are going to give you eight, 10% return on your investment. You put it in a car, you're probably losing it all. You put it in a house, you know, your own personal little fun. You go travel the world. You're probably losing all that money, but you have something in front of you here that you could actually put $1 in, and then you could get a a hundred times return on your investment, a right. 200 times return on your investment, right. a 500 times return on your investment. <laughs> and instead people are so afraid to do that. They don't view their businesses that way. They view their business as like costs, right? 
But instead, if you actually have it systemized, you know that like, okay, you know, I, if I put this dollar in, I know that I can get this four or five, six dollars out. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, fearless is a good word, but you just have to kind of be aware that like, there's no real better way. Right. And at some point you'll get to the point, like kind of where I'm at right now, where the amount of money my business is spending off, I really couldn't put this right back in the business. Like it would be, everything would break. If I tried to put this amount of money into paid ads like this month, everything would just Mm -hmm. get destroyed. So at that point, it's like, okay, now I can focus on maybe some other wealth building strategies, whatever else it is. But I think people kind of jump that gun a little bit. And in the very beginning, if you listen to, I read biographies and autobiographies voraciously. I read, I listen to podcasts, uh, how I built this, a lot of other great ones that are like taking people who started and scaled multiple nine figure companies, exits, that kind of stuff. And every single time you hear, they don't take a salary and they just put every single dollar right back inside of the business. And so you saying, or you thinking that you're any different, you're kind of kidding yourself there. And it, it is a little scary for sure. But what's scarier to me is not giving enough money back inside of my business and then losing my business. The number one reason why businesses fail is lack of cash, right? They don't, they have a cash trough. And so for you, you should be either a holding the business, the money to the side and ready for an investment inside of the business, like a coach or a consultant or something like that, Mm -hmm. or B you should just be putting it right back in something that works. The example I gave earlier, you had it, someone they're working the hundred sending a hundred emails out one out of the hundred is becoming a client hire five more people to the exact, like, what would you be afraid of? Now you have five times the amount of work going into the thing that you know is generating you, you know, one client for every hundred emails sent, but it just gets scary to people when they start putting money back in their business. They'd rather keep it into a savings account that gets you 0.0001%, but that's a conversation for <laughs> time. But the idea is like, you are the best bet you could ever make in your life. I really hold, I don't know anybody that's listening to this podcast, but I bet you you're the best bet you can make in your entire life. So why not make that investment? Yeah, I've, um, Actually, in 2020, which of course being a COVID year was a pretty rough year for most of the people in my industry, I didn't go down in investments in my own personal development and coaching. I went up. Yep. And so instead of my normal 20,000 investment, I went up to 38. And people are like, what are you crazy? You know, it's a really bad year to be doing that. But I just look at it as, as an investment in myself. And if one thing that I got from that helps me, you know, double my business, gosh, that's certainly going to be worth it. So, okay. Uh, Ravi, thank you so much for uh, sharing some of your ideas with us today. If people want to get your free course, three steps to scaling, what should they do? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. First of all, Jane, for having me on here. I really do appreciate it. If you guys like Jane's podcasts like this, I always say this on podcasts, make sure I had a podcast myself. Give her five stars on whatever platform you're listening to this to. It makes a big, big difference. Yeah, I I know that myself. But absolute pleasure, Jane. Thank you so much. If anybody here got some value, thank you guys so much. I really hope you did. The best way you guys uh, can reach me is any social media channels. You type in my first and last name, Ravi Buvala. I'm sure you can find me. But we do have a free course where I go a lot more in depth on that kind of product market fit, the lead generation, the paid ads, the sales funnels, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's called the three steps to scale. It's about four and a half hours of free content. And if you go to scalingwithsystems.com slash wealthy, uh, then you guys can get, we have a whole separate lander for you guys. Like I said, you don't pay a dime. We just ask for an email and uh, you get all that, that content instantly. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate that you uh, suggested that people give us five star review, make sure that you are subscribing so that you don't miss any valuable future content that we have coming down the pike for you. And, um, we're going to be, um, really looking forward to having more and more conversations about scaling your speaking business as we go throughout the year. Thanks everybody for listening. And with that, we'll say, see you soon, wealthy speakers.